And if you have your Bible with you, I invite you to open it to today's text, which is taken from the Gospel of Luke chapter 12, verses 32 to 40. And as we hear God's word proclaimed and preached, let's come before him to illumine us that we might receive the message he has for each of us today. Let us pray. (coughs) Loving God, help us so to hear your holy word, that we may truly understand, and that understanding we might believe, and that believing we might follow in faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all we do, through Christ alone. Amen. So Luke 12, and I'm starting at verse 32. These are words of Jesus. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve and will have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, where is your heart? A rather simple question of anatomy, it would appear at first. Or maybe not. A kindergarten teacher asked a little boy where his heart is, and the boy insisted it was down there as he pointed to the seat of his pants. Now, why do you say that's where your heart is, asked the teacher. Because, said the little boy, my grandmother is always patting me there and saying, bless your little heart. (laughs) In our text today, Jesus talks about the location of our hearts, too. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, he says. A profound and important observation, to be sure. But first, Jesus begins by telling us about the greatest treasure of all. It's the kingdom of God, which is freely given to us. Do not be afraid, my little flock, Jesus says, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. And what a gift that is. But Jesus goes on explaining that we have some responsibilities in receiving that gift. You know, with every gift, there comes some level of responsibility. Sometimes it's just a thank you note and nothing else. But often it's much more. When parents give their daughter the brand new guitar that she always wanted, with it she resumes the responsibility to practice and grow into her full musical potential. A young man inherits his grandfather's hunting rifle But with it comes the responsibility for learning how to use it carefully, to treat it gently, and to keep it safely out of innocent hands. A college receives a large bequest and assumes the responsibility of ensuring that scholarship dollars go to the most deserving and the most likely to fulfill academic expectations. So what are the expectations that come with being given freely the kingdom of heaven? It's not insignificant, for Jesus says here that it is in giving up materialistic ways, sharing our wealth, being constantly on guard for his return. Add to these the other ways he expects his followers to act, like loving our enemies, loving our neighbors, loving our brothers and sisters, turning the other cheek, serving others, doing to others as we would have them do to us. Well, you get the idea. Yes, the kingdom of God is a free gift and it's secure forever. But nevertheless, be watchful, be mindful, be ready for the Lord's return at any moment, be loving, be kind, be forgiving, because only such a posture of devotion and readiness displays the kind of grateful heart that is only fitting for people who have received such a great gift to have as that one is. 
a gift by which we are freed from sin and death and hopelessness and despair, and a gift by which we are also freed for life in this world. We're freed from fear of scarcity so that we can be generous with others. We're freed from the fear of condemnation so that we can forgive others. We are freed from the fear of falling short, of failing, of being unacceptable so that we can live for our neighbors and love our neighbors, sharing with others the good news that God is pleased to give us all, all of us, His kingdom. Jesus says His Father is pleased to give us the kingdom. He doesn't say that the Father reluctantly gives us the kingdom or that we have to try really hard to earn it first. No, Jesus says He really wants to give us the kingdom. And just count the blessings that come with the kingdom of heaven. Joy that comes from knowing that our sins are forgiven. That they need not be dragged with us through life like an ever-increasing load of garbage that we can't get rid of. Comes from the knowledge that despite what we might think of ourselves or what others might think about us, you and I are deeply, deeply loved by the one who created us. It's the assurance that comes from knowing that the value of our lives is not to be measured by our bank accounts, nor how beautiful we are, nor by our standings in the community, nor by our fears, nor by our failings, nor by our accomplishments, nor even by the amount of good that we've done in the kingdom, but simply by this, that God values you and me so highly as to provide himself as the sacrifice on a cross for our sins. In God's opinion, you and I were worth dying for. And our Father freely gives us eternal, abundant life in His kingdom now and forever. Forever is a long time. The hymn writer put it best. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. I read a (coughs) funny story, I thought, about a computer glitch that affected a sports betting website in Australia. Some customers on a website named Iasbet discovered that the site inadvertently was allowing fans to place bets on past horse races. What happens if you place a bet on a horse race that's already been won? Well, you win lots of money. You can't lose. Jesus is telling his disciples in our text this morning, listen, I already know the end of your story. I know the outcome of your race. You can't lose. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Oh Lord, give us eyes to see that. For how all of our fears would be wiped away in the security of seeing the outcome of our lives, the outcome of our circumstances, the outcome of our eternities, as Jesus already has. Now admittedly, though a glorious text, this is also a hard text. Jesus says to us, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. You think I can adequately explain this text? No. <laughs> Even though you pay me big bucks to do it, I admit I can't. So instead, I'm going to tell a story that I think explains the meaning of this text really well. It was written by an Elizabeth Meyer Bolton. She wrote, My grandmother's name is Nellie Caroline Meyer. In her prime, she was a force to be reckoned with. Tall, full-figured, and bold. She loved a good hat, a pretty dress, and fire engine red lipstick. In the 1950s and 60s, with the threat of nuclear war looming, apparently Nellie stockpiled her basement with cans of tomatoes, tuna, and bean salad. During the sugar shortage of the 70s, she filled her cupboards with sugar, brown, refined, and raw. When the energy crisis came, she became obsessed with keeping the needle of her Buick's gas gauge above the three-quarter full mark. Every other day, she would wait in long lines to get filled back up, My grandfather could never understand this, and one day he'd had enough. My goodness, Nellie, he said, do we really need to wait in line for gas again? We've got three quarters of a tank. And every member of my family can recite her answer word for word. 
Well, Jimmy, of course we have to wait in line. We've got to get that gas before the hoarders do. <laughs> now, the writer of this story, Elizabeth Meyer Bolton, comments, My grandmother's past came to my mind at the beginning of COVID. As I wrestled a gigantic package of toilet paper down the stairs and into our basement, only to discover two identical unopened packages already there. Minutes earlier, I'd raced through Costco, hurriedly eating smoked almonds out of a fluted paper cup, convinced that we were about to run out of toilet paper, that there wasn't enough. And isn't it the case that lots of time in this broken world of ours, it feels like there is not enough? With war in Ukraine, the threat of war in Asia, it feels like there isn't enough peace. With all the pain and disappointment in our lives, or even in the lives of those we love, it feels as though there isn't enough hope and healing to go around. And with death all around us, is there enough life to go around? And like Grandma Nellie in the story, we wait in long lines, working hard and spending lots of time to get the things we believe we need to cling to for solace and security. Toilet paper, gas, clothes, property, status, gadgets, human praise and adoration, money, retirement portfolios, or even cans of bean salad. We wait and fret and work and worry. In our text this morning, Jesus talks about these things and the kingdom of God. Don't be afraid, he says. Sell your possessions. Be generous and free. Trust in God's grace and love and life, for there's more than enough of that. And that's a big theme of the whole Bible, too. The good news of God's abundant, sustaining, life-giving grace and love is like a heartbeat animating the whole of Scripture. From the Garden of Eden in the beginning of Genesis to the Tree of Life at the end of the book of Revelation, with those emerald green leaves that hold abundant healing for all the nations. In a nutshell, the Bible from Genesis 3 to Revelation 22 tells the story of a God recklessly abundant in grace and mercy and love in his desire to get his family back. And God struck the decisive blow of reconciliation when his son died on Calvary's cross to atone for our sins. And the Bible's last scene, like the parable of the lost son, ends in jubilation. God's family united once again in the holy city by Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. So Jesus himself says, Fear not, for your Father is the one who created you and will sustain you, care for you, and never let you go. Fear not, the God who wishes to give you the kingdom is the God who will provide all your needs. Fear not, for God became flesh in order to touch us, to teach us, to heal us, to take our ashes out of the ground and bring us back to life. We need not fear, but simply trust in him. In Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. <coughs> Elizabeth Meyer Bolton then conclude, concludes her story with this profound observation, and it gets to the point. She says, Today, all of my grandmother Nellie Caroline Meyer's hats, cars, lipstick, and canned goods are gone. Everything she owns fits perfectly into the wardrobe of her room in a nursing home where strong, kind people clip her nails, wipe strawberry jam from the corners of her mouth, and transfer her three times a day from a bed to a wheelchair. Sometimes when I visit and find my grandmother looking small and insignificant, it breaks my heart. But if you ask her how she's doing, she'll tell you she has everything she needs people who care about her, a warm bed, and the inexhaustible grace of God. It's enough. She's cast off all her possessions. The thieves and the moths no longer come around because her treasure is already in heaven. She's waiting for her master and friend, for her Lord Jesus, to come for her at an unexpected, unknown, but glorious hour. Grandma Nellie has a wisdom that certainly comes with age. And if we live long enough, I think her story will ultimately be all of our stories. But still, the point is this. Our hearts will be where our treasure is. Those who are greedy and anxious about stuff make the decision to invest their hearts on earth. And that's all the reward they'll get. 
complete with the broken relationships and emptiness and loneliness that comes with pursuing these things with all one's being. That those who are free are wanting to be free from a preoccupation with or an attachment to stuff and who rest and trust in God's provision, these folks invest their hearts in heaven. And as theologian Felicia Masonheimer puts it, those who invest their hearts in heaven discover that God is far kinder, greater, and gentler than we ever imagined. And with that discovery comes joy, peace that passes understanding, purpose, hope, acceptance, love, forgiveness, and abundant life. In short, treasure and everything we could ever desire. So may we invest wisely and eternally for all those things we so are so desperately seeking in this world and in this life are already right here waiting for us right now in Christ. For our Father is pleased to give us the kingdom. And that, my friends, is good news, eh? Amen. Let's respond in song.